All right, so uh, our first, our opening act, my starting pitcher here today is uh, Parker. Um, I remember the first time I saw his project, it was, it, when I read, the, I read the description, you know, it was like, a guy is taking a picture of a tree with his iPhone every day, and I was like, okay. Okay, I, you know, I, I was intrigued, and I looked at the photos, and it was kind of what I loved about Preston's work yesterday. It was, it wasn't like, it's not like an idea that it's amazing, it's the execution that is so amazing, and one of the things we saw with her story is like, I mean, obviously it's hard to tell uh, the story she was doing before was just executed well, and that's one thing I love about artwork, is it's so simple, and it's the kind of thing that I feel like, if I really try, maybe, you put in a little effort, you can do something like this, and it's such a great idea, and I'm, I'm sure you put some way more effort than more than did on this project, <laughs> Uh, but the photos are just really awesome. Like you can't, I couldn't believe they're shot with an iPhone. Like, I can't believe someone would, would stick to a project like that for so long. And uh, the way that they're marketing it, and the book is coming out, it's out there, you can pre order it. There is a, uh, uh, a discount for you non iPad people. There might be an iPad in the book. Gotcha. <laughs> 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 um, anyway, so I'm going to let Mark do his thing. But yes, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Probably the first question that I'm going to ask when people discover the project is, how did it come about? And uh, ironically, it came about because I bought an iPhone. <laughs> kind of crazy. I had a, I, I had a, a, a trio that the Smithsonian requested when I uh, upgraded to my Samsung device. So I, I'm not a guy that jumps up by the latest technology. And they, they set me up with a Samsung, uh, was it Galaxy 2? And I had it for all like two weeks, and I'm like, ah, this thing's just kind of flimsy. And, and uh, you, the, the spring deal, you can trade in within 30 days and get a new phone. And I went in there, and they saw me coming, and they, they right away they, they pegged me, and they're like, oh, damn, photographer's gonna get traded in his Galaxy to get an iPhone. So I got the iPhone, and I posted it on my Facebook page, yeah, I got the iPhone. And, and a friend of mine who's a photographer in the Twin Cities, she sent me a note, and she's like, Oh, isn't the camera great? And I'm like, seriously? The camera on the iPhone is now inspired me by the iPhone. But she's like, seriously, you need to take some pictures with it. So I'm driving home, it's a crazy snowy day, uh, January 20th of last year. And I, I, I live uh, six miles from town in the country, I have a 200 acre farm at. And I've been driving by this tree for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I've admired it, and I'm kind of an outdoors sort of guy. Love mountain biking, love hiking, hunting, fishing. Driven by it, admired it. It's two miles from my home, and I've never so much as taken a single frame of it. So based on the Corey's challenge, I hopped out of my truck, ran down in my dress shoes, I made a half a dozen frames, freezing my butt off, got back home, and I'm like, oh great, how do I get these off my iPhone? I never really just got the phone. So I emailed them to myself. And I opened up the, the first frame on the computer and, and I literally just started laughing and they're all going, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Because the first digital camera I used was the uh, was it the NC2000, the Canon, AP, and Kodak product. You know, it was it was huge, you know, and it was as big as a laptop, uh, four megapixel camera, uh, noisy, uh, what a contrast in resolution. And I pulled an iPhone out of my pocket and I made that frame. And uh, so, so based on her challenge and the excitement and the fun I had of rediscovering a moment in photography where I was doing it and it was for me and it was something that was enjoyable versus shooting for a client where, you know, I, I stopped shooting pictures for me years ago. And uh, so based, based on that situation, I, I, I thought, you know what, it'd be kind of neat to try and make a picture day of my iPhone, whatever inspired me. So I started just taking a picture a day and uh, I did that for all March 13th, I'm driving home, and I washed my truck, and I hadn't made a picture, it's about sunset, and uh, driving home, and I'm looking for something between me and this gorgeous sunset. I turned on the county road, and I looked at that tree, and I'm like, holy crap, the tree's in the right spot, so I ran down, and I made another picture of it. And I uh, went home, and I uploaded it to my Facebook page, and uh, two weeks later, on March 23rd, a good friend of mine from Seattle saw the photo, and she sends me a note, Dude, what's with you in that tree? You gotta do a photo a day of it. <laughs> and the next day, I started a project, and that's where the theme that tree came from. Huh. So, you, you know, and, and early on, uh, so I'm making a picture a day, uh, 
trying to trying to be creative, challenging myself, trying to figure out how to make the iPhone do what I wanted to do. I wasn't using filters, I wasn't using Instagram filters, wasn't using Hipstamatic. It was all just using the uh, iPhone application. And it didn't take me long to discover the iPhone camera. There's, you have no control over exposure. I mean, you can't do anything. It's point and shoot. And uh, so I bought Camera Plus. And uh, Camera Plus was great because it allowed me to pick the spot to focus on, allowed me to pick the spot to expose based on. But a, a lot of the pictures I was trying to shoot were early in the morning, before sunrise, late at night after sunset, and the iPhone has no clue. And, and I'm looking for a highlight to base an exposure on so I can capture all those gorgeous colors, and of course there's no way to do it. So I took to carrying a flashlight, my flashlight was my manual shutter control. I mean, it, it worked fantastically. It was a pragmatic way of making it use of a faster shutter speed. And uh, so, uh, a month in, my wife was like, oh, early on, my wife was like, you're doing what? I said, I'm taking a picture of my little tree. And she's like, why? <laughs> And uh, yeah, kind of a tough one to sell. She, she's working a nine to five day job, uh, bringing home a steady paycheck. I'm a freelance photographer where the, the ebb and flow, and I tell them I'm going to be investing this time every day to take taking a picture of a tree. Kind of a tough sell. So, but so I, I kept doing that, and I, I started running all the challenges with the technical aspects of the iPhone. Um, I, I figured out how to get the uh, the exposures to work in my favor. And then I did every day for years. So we got into winter. You guys know what winters are like in the Midwest. And uh, the next technical hurdle that I ran into is that the iPhone is not like cold weather. It absolutely hates it. And I, I go to Farmer and Fleet and I buy a gross of those grabber hand warmers and carry them in my pocket. And uh, but once it started getting below zero, those weren't even enough to make it work. And I, I'd be out there, I'd be laying there in the snow waiting for the sunrise. The sunlight would paint its way down the tree. It'd be perfect light and the phone would shut down. Uh, really frustrating, and uh, so uh, I have one of those uh, Alien B Vagabond batteries, and so I, I plug the phone into the Alien B Vagabond battery and I take it out with me, and for some reason, you know, it, the phone didn't get any warmer, still stayed cold, but having that constant voltage, uh, the phone continued to function. So just all these little funky hurdles I had to overcome by, by forcing myself to shoot this with the iPhone. So it, it, it was all about me, it was all about challenging myself, all about trying to be re-inspired about photography, trying to get excited again about photography for me. And uh, the, the local hometown newspaper got work on my project, it was uh, June 7th. And the, the hometown paper wants to do a story on me, I'm like, oh my god. They're going to do a story in the local paper, and then everybody and their brothers going to want to friend me on Facebook so they can follow this project. So I'm like, okay, I have to find a solution for this. So, I mean, the, the beauty of social network marketing. So I created a Facebook page for that tree. And uh, the local paper ran the story, 300 followers overnight. And uh, continued to post photos organically, picking up followers. And the, the friend that go to me using my iPhone as a camera also insisted that I get on Instagram. So I got on Instagram, and through Instagram, I was following people that were, like all of us, professional photographers. Um, other than professional photographers, the only people that I was connecting with were friends. So it was kind of an interesting network. You know, you could see what other people were doing, challenging themselves using the iPhone, you know, the real basic approach to photography, to true photography, keeping it simple. And uh, there's a guy named Casey Madison out of Seattle that I was following. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm doing this project in mid September, and I get a phone call. I'm, I'm on a John Deere assignment in uh, Wayne, Nebraska. And the challenge for the project was that I committed to posting a photo every day, but it, it, within a couple of weeks of doing it, shooting it every day, I, I changed my focus and decided I'm going to shoot a photo every day. And uh, early in the project, I had two weekends where I had a, a travel assignment uh, for the New York Times in Iowa, where I had to shoot an extra photo on Friday and post it on Saturday. And, and I kind of, kind of felt guilty about it. And uh, so, so I'm in uh, Wayne, Nebraska, and I'm going to miss two days of my project. And so I had shot some extra photos that I could post while I was away. And I, I wrapped up my shoot that day, and I got a phone call. It was Jim Sider from MSNBC. And I figured, oh, he's calling me, he wants me to shoot a Republican candidate campaign in Iowa. And he says, no, actually, he says, I said two desks away from Meredith Burkett. And I'm like, oh, Meredith from my Instagram. And he says, yeah, Meredith and I are both uh, photo producers at NBC. And he says, we're interested in doing a story on you. He says, uh, Meredith finally refers to you as the tree stalker. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, so I'm like, well, this is really cool. So they, they interviewed me that next day when I'm driving back to Iowa. And uh, October 9th, they ran a story on the NBC photo blog. And within three days, I picked up another 1,000 followers. And, and the project has just continued to organically grow in followers ever since. Um, I think I'm at 5,700 and change. And these aren't bot followers. I mean, these are people that are thoroughly engaged. Uh, when the project was nearing the one month from its conclusion, I started on March 24th of 2012. It's going to conclude on March 23rd of this year. So a month out, I started getting these emails from people. And the primary demographic of followers, 75% of them are women, 35 to 55, which is an ideal demographic because they have all the money. <laughs> <laughs> or they're in charge of the money. And uh, so this, this, this incredible database of potential customers. Uh, now the other thing is that with Warren's proposal that we do a book, Warren came into the equation early on as well. He sent me a note and said, Hershey, I'm really digging this. I think if you do it for a year, we can publish a really nice book. And so that's how we got to where we are. Uh, a month out, all these people have been following it. They're thoroughly engaged. They're, they're really stressing. And so uh, we decided that we would create an event, a uh, conclusory event, where we invited people to participate. And uh, based on the social network marketing and the public interest, almost 300 people came to pose and be on the floor for the last day. So uh, I'll tell you what, I'm just gonna scroll through some pictures here and I'll talk about some images as they come up if there's a story behind them. And, and, and this is one of the first photos where I was out there, you know, waiting for the sun and eyes. And, uh, you know, light is the key to what we do. And as a result of this project, you know, it did take me long, a month or so in the project to realize that I'd forgotten how to capitalize and appreciate and make the best of natural light. And that day when I sat there, I was out there at 4.30 in the morning and I watched the sunrise and paint its way down that tree and just before it got to the grass in the foreground, it just, just an incredible, uh, incredible circumstance, incredible movement for me. And definitely helping me recognize what I forgot about the photography. Just incredible diversity of images. You know, people are like, oh, like, but you took a picture, the same picture every day. I'm like, oh my God, I had it more than two years really early on. Uh, the day I shot this one, this was within a month of the project, and I finally realized, you know, I need to start exploring, I need to move out and beyond. And discovered the skull about 400 yards from the tree, and, you know, I, I know that environment really well. And, and people don't realize, you know, I, I know the photo a day things have been done, but most people that have done a photo a day, they don't restrict themselves to a geographic feature or, or an element on the landscape like I did. And, and what, it, what it resulted in is that my family had to make some fat sacrifices as well. Uh, we didn't do a family vacation. Uh, every February I go with my buddies on this, this grand ski trip to Utah. And I passed them the ski trip in February, and they're all like, what, you, you can't shoot six photos and have them in the bag to publish? Well, I could have, but it just, you know, it just would have felt right, and, and I kind of felt like I would have been compromising my potential achievement of doing a picture a day of something for a whole year. So early on, the black roots hated me, you know? I mean, this tree is far removed from anything. It's down in the middle of the cornfield, and this human being starts showing up, and red-winged blackbirds, they are just the most troublesome birds. They swoop and dive and squawk at me, and the last day of my project, when I was out there shooting my last creative photo, the birds were singing to me. <coughs> now this photo, this, this was early on as well, and I was trying to figure out a way, you know, there's a way to synchronize with the iPhone, you know, there's no, no sync setting. And uh, I, I set up a couple of uh, uh, Canon flash units with uh, my radio remotes on them. And then uh, using uh, uh, Nightcap, which is an application that allows you to do a one second exposure. And I would activate the exposure on the iPhone and then I'd pop the flash units. And I, I was out there until my dusk light was gone and it was too dark to make it work. And literally this is the only frame I got. Uh, just all those little challenges to try and make it perform in a way that's not assigned to it. Uh, wonderful drug here. Made it 
nice for me, I didn't have to shoot the rain very often. But uh, I live in the country, I have marginal wireless, or marginal uh, digital DSL servers, and uh, I have my local library coaching their wireless sending photos. And, you know, this sort of a project, guys, I mean, it was quality of light that dictated when I was there, it was weather events that dictated when I was there, and I uploaded a gigabyte of photos to a healthcare client. I walked out of the public library and went to the sky and I did, and oh my god, I'm six miles from the tree, and I'm like, holy crap, that's a bigger opportunity. <laughs> I jumped in my truck, made a beeline out there, and I did not often drive my truck in the field. I really drove my truck down in the field. I made a dozen frames before this thing blew over and dropped, you know, no rain at all. Hmm. This is one of those magical nights. It was kind of a fun discovery opportunity using the iPhone. Uh, I'm out there, I had a preconceived notion. I was just going to get a dust bowl of the tree. And uh, the other thing that this project made me start doing is using a tripod on a regular basis. In my newspaper days, I never used a tripod. You know, just push the, push the ISO to the max and uh, do whatever it took to handle. But because I was shooting so early in the morning or so late at night, um, and Forcing the iPhone to use extremely slow shutter speeds, I, I uh, used my Manfrotto magic arm. I would clamp one end to the tripod, and it's like a hand that held the iPhone perfectly. So I'm out there, and I've got my iPhone in the, uh, the magic arm, and uh, the fireflies come out. So I tried using uh, the, the iPhone camera app, couldn't capture them. Tried Pro Camera, couldn't capture them. Tried Camera Plus, couldn't capture them. And then I thought, I don't know if slow shutter would do it. So slow shutter to, to do the exposure, you activate it. You got a little tiny window. Then the, the, the primary LCD, you see the picture appear on the screen. And I think technically what it's doing is stacking video frames. But I'm laying there in the grass watching the firefly flew through the scene. It was like somebody took a paintbrush and just swiped a red, a, a yellow stripe across it. And, and I verbally went, oh my god. And so I got up, and I'm not running out in the field. I'm trying to hurt fireflies. <laughs> And, and there's this house that is right up the valley from the tree, and their their meeting picture window looks up in the valley, and God knows what they thought I was doing. At some point, I knocked at the door. I forget better explain. I'm not a crazy guy wandering around the middle of the field. Uh, this was a really cool situation. This is a woman who lives in Colorado. Her family is from Platteville, and at some point in time, organically, she discovered the project. They were going to be in town visiting friends, and so she sent me an email on Facebook and said, Hey, is there any chance you could meet me and my boys and take them onto the tree? And I really hadn't had any opportunities to include people in photos other than the solo of the farmer of the harvest and hay. And so I said, Sure, but uh, can you meet me at like 8 in the morning? So I still have good quality of light. <laughs> so she came and met me, and uh, five year old said to a little boy, and I said, You guys just go ahead and walk to the tree. And I was just following you down there. So I'm following them through the grass. And, Little boys all excited about bugs and this and that and the tree that they've seen on this Facebook page. Just gesturing with the mom. It was just a fantastic moment. It was the closest thing to photojournalism that I was able to experience in this project. And then just, you know, all the little detailed discoveries, the things that I would not have paid attention to, the things that I would not have photographed in the past. You know, I'm shooting bugs. Uh, the day I shot this, I'm wandering around the tree. I'm lucky. And you know, sometimes we look too hard. We're, we're trying to force a photo. And the one thing about this project is it made me slow down and relax and just embrace the situation. And the pictures came to me, walking by the tree, appreciating the details of things, and I discovered that little moth on the bar. And it's just all these little simple opportunities. And then a lot of anticipating life. Uh, another one shot with nightcap, and this is another one goes with my family. It's like, you're going where and why? It's lightning. I've got to try to get a picture of the tree with lightning. <laughs> uh, my, my trusty companion, Magnum, uh, went with me a lot. I stopped taking when the snow fell because he didn't want his tracks everywhere. He's crazy, just runs like a madman. But uh, August, uh, hotter than heck, and so I, I brought a water bottle and brought a collapse of the water dish. So Maggie and I are down there in the morning and I'm waiting for sunset, and uh, he's just dying. So I sat down, poured him a dish of water, and the dog's sitting to my right, and he's drinking water, and he sits up, and he 
comes over, drinks water again, and he sits up and watches her nothing. And I see the tree framed in love with the dog. I'm like, Magnum Stig! <laughs> <laughs> And the tree is a bur oak. And if you ever wondered why it's called a bur oak, this is why. The, the eyelashes on the, uh, the shells of the acorn. <coughs> and Japanese beetle storage of everything green, but darn made a nice picture. Trust me, guys, I saw a lot of sunrises and a lot of sunsets. More sunrises than sunsets than I've seen in years. And after a year of my, my body clock, now I just wake up at the right time of the day. Uh, blizzard. <laughs> uh, 
early early January, this is all my family is like, oh my God, he is he is certifiable. But I put on put on my North Face gear, put on my North Face gear, my my garment padded heat pants, and my my insulated boots, and I trudged out there in that storm and uh, uh, crazy. Um, lay there in the snow, trying to make this picture, but God, it, it, when I got home and I downloaded it, it just you know it's kind of rewarding for me. I, I beat Mother Nature and I need a picture. Uh, and this one, this is one of those, I, I shot this handheld, and I'm like, oh God, I didn't bring my tripod, and you really need the tripod, I mean, that's the shell of the acorn. And this is shot using the, the best application for close focus, I, I discovered was the, the standard iPhone application. So I ran back to my truck, you know, 400 yards away, got the tripod, brought the tripod back down, set the tripod all up, put the phone in the, the magic arm, <coughs> moving in to compose on that, that acorn shell, and I knocked it off. <laughs> so luckily, I had one in the handheld frames. And this is just one of those little 15 nano rubber bands with a close up lens attached to it. And this is one of those compositions. I had shot this many times over the course of the project, but I just never got one really, really made me feel like I made a picture that I was happy with. And I went out there that day and you know, the, 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 the trunk of the trees is less than 10 yards away, but the fog was so thick that the contrast totally fell off that quickly. And it just, it was really a, a cool opportunity, kind of changing. Sunsets. Um, the, the day I posted this photo, I, I, I shot it at night. I was driving home from a, a, something my daughter, Madison. And I saw it from 20 miles away, I'm like, oh, that'll be over by the time I get to the tree. And I got to the tree and ran down in the field and made a dozen frames and got back and drove home that night and processed them in snap seed and was like, wow, that's a really nice sunset. And oh God, it's the double cliche of sunset and the silhouette. And I got up the next morning at sunrise, it was a gray overcast day. And I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, well, I guess I'll use that sunset photo. So I, I posted this one. And, and of all the pictures that I've posted over the course of the year, this was the absolute most popular photo on the Facebook page. Hmm. Like 2,500 likes, uh, 300 people shared it, um, therefore it ended up at rose to the top and we're using it for the cover of the blog. Hmm. Uh, snow and ice storm, ice storm in January. Gloomy overcast day, and God, I have a hard time getting excited about gloomy overcast light, especially when you shoot the same thing you've looked at for an entire year. And I drove down there and I scraped the uh, ice off all my windows except for my back window. And I got in the truck and I was getting my tripod out. And when I was getting my tripod out, I hit the, I accidentally hit the, the raise and lower button on the window. And the window went halfway down and that sheet of ice stayed right there. So I'm like, holy crap, I wonder if I can use that as a tool to make a picture. So I rolled the window down and got in my truck and put the camera as close as I could. And that shot through a sheet of ice. Another just pragmatic opportunity. So this was a really cool day. So the day I shot this picture, um, I was hired by the Iowa Tourism Association to uh, speak at their annual meeting. They, I was a paid speaker, which was something different for me. And uh, so I, I did the presentation, uh, secured some other potential speaking opportunities as a result. But I drove home, and I, I had an email from uh, the photo editor at the, the Chicago Tribune that same day saying, hey, Warren had approached them, and they had kind of had an idea of how they were going to use the pictures. but he had sent me an email saying, hey, you know what, we've decided that we're going to send a photographer to your final photo event with the public. And uh, so I'm out in the field that night. It was a gorgeous light. made three or four different photos that I really liked. And I'm just out there, you know, like a kid. I'm just giggling because I thought that was pretty funny that a newspaper was going to take a picture of me naked a picture. <laughs> and uh, the, 
then I, I know one of my business partners, uh, he lives in Seattle, and he's the guy who said, dude, what's with you in that tree? So I FaceTimed him with the tree in the background. So he and I visited and, and laughed, and hey, see you later, Greg, and he cut off on FaceTime. And I turned around, and in the time from me taking a picture and visiting with him, the light had totally changed. And I turned around, and this is the scene I saw. And I'm like, holy crap. And uh, I tried shooting it. I really wanted to emphasize that shadow in the foreground, but it just didn't quite work for me. And uh, so to, to get the effect I wanted, I actually used the iPro wide angle lens attachment. And it's, it's kind of soft, actually, it's really soft at the edge. It's kind of got a sweet spot. But the light is gorgeous and just the crazy contrast. So I think I posted it was a good day when I posted this photo. And this one, this is kind of the, one of those weird metaphorical moments for me. So if, for 365 days, I'm trudging out there making pictures of this tree. And uh, we got a fresh snowfall. You know, it was a crazy March snowstorm, uh, almost a foot of snow. And, with all that fresh snow, I made really wide paths to the tree because I didn't want to see my footprints. And as I'm making my way to the tree, I discovered this white-tailed deer that was making its way to the tree to forage for acorns. I'm like, it's just so cool, so symbolic. Uh, I'm, I'm making my tree the way my way to the tree for pictures, and this deer is making its way to the tree for survival. Hmm. And then uh, this is the day before the last photo, and I decided, you know what's going to be my last opportunity for a creative photo of the tree because the group photos of all these people is just more of a historical documentary. Thing. So, kind of make it full circle, it's, it's the same composition from that snowy shot I took back in January. So, the day of the event, um, 200 cars, 300 people, 12 dogs. Uh, absolutely <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, you, you just, you guys cannot imagine what an emotionally fulfilling and exciting opportunity it was. And, and, and it's just bizarre, because for a tree, um, a tree and the execution of the pictures and the fact that all these people were somehow inspired by, by my commitment to do something that most of us probably would think is kind of ludicrous. Um, but yeah, just absolutely incredible. And so this is me, the best picture. And actually, I, I gave them all a heart attack as I climbed uh, 50 feet up in the tree and shot this one. But in order to get that wide group of people, again, I had to use that high pro wide lens. It's just too soft. And then nice conclusory shot of me and my pal Matt. So then the, the business end of things. So, Warren and I discovered early on that, you know, with all this, this viral interest in the project, we had to find a way to capitalize on it. We, we decided, okay, we're going to publish a book, we're going to self-publish a book. Uh, self-publishing a book, you may or may not be holding to the marketing or uh, business strategies of a traditional publisher. Um, they typically take all the money unless you're a really recognized artist where you, or, or author where you get uh, the, the front money. I'm not going to get any front money, I'm nobody. And uh, so Warren had done a project with a, a, another photographer self-publishing a book. And we decided, okay, well, we need funding. Um, am I going to take out a loan? Are we going to spend our own money? And uh, we decided that, you know, with, with crowdsource funding being so popular, maybe we could do our own version of crowdsource funding. We had a captive audience of 5,700 people following the project. They're thoroughly engaged. They're not people that, that were bought to follow. They're following it because every day, it was kind of like they're, they're I'm not kidding, I get emails from people. It's like their daily devotion, waiting to see what a Hirsch post for a tree uh, for, for today. Or, or they're waiting, going, oh, there's no way he can't come up with another composition. But so you've got all these people that are thoroughly engaged. So um, we hired a web developer, um, put all 365 live photos on the, on the page, uh, built a pre order site for the book. Um, conceived a concept where we would do a pre-order collector's edition, which was a book and a photograph, and then, then we set a, a sunset date on it because we wanted to inspire people to move. We wanted to have an idea of how many books are we going to be able to afford to print. And based on dollar figures for our cost for different print runs, we set our sights on minimum. We would do would be a thousand. If things went well, we would do twenty-five hundred, and if things went really well, we would do five thousand books. And uh, things were going extremely well. And uh, you, you know, it's, it's kind of like advertising. It's top of mind awareness. Uh, just like 
just like uh, social network marketing as it is, if you don't keep things fresh on a page, people stop following it. Uh, Vince probably tweets multiple times a day, and that's how you keep people paying attention to what you have going on. So I was posting well, we set a sunset of, of April 15th, and the last week I realized, oh geez, you know, it's Sunday, the, the, the two days before tax day, and that was strategic too, we decided tax day would be a great one, because everybody's got deadlines that day anyways. So on Sunday, I posted a, another reminder on Facebook, but we didn't want to seem pushy. We, we didn't want to feel like a, a commercial entity because these people are passionately embracing this project, not because two guys are pitching it as a business project, but because it's this organic, feel good, just a, it was a nice, innocuous story. So on Sunday, I post this reminder, hey, uh, the window of opportunity for the, the, the mail to you autograph copy of the book or the collector's edition is uh, midnight of April 15th. And we picked up an extra 180 book sales in 24 hours at 40 bucks a book. So absolutely incredible. Powerful strategy. Well, guys, um, you're probably tired of me talking at you. Why don't we open up for some questions? I was curious. I know you can't age or figure out how old the tree is. But Actually, you, I can't. Oh, you can't? Okay. I can't, yeah. That's, that's, that's another interesting thing. So historically, as a result of the project, there's a, a gentleman who publishes uh, a, a real nice grassroots magazine called Woodlands and Prairies, and he got a hold of me and he wanted to do a feature on me. But, but his first question is, how old is the tree? I don't know how old the tree is. And, and he goes, who, who owned it? Who's the first owner of the land? I'm like, well, I didn't know any of that. So I, I became a word journalist. So I, I started researching and went to the, uh, the register of deeds, found out who the original owner of the property was, found out who the surveyor was that surveyed the property for the Federal Land Survey, and uh, hired, he hired uh, a geologist who does core samples on the trees to come out, and in December he did a core sample on the tree. The tree is hollow, but he said based on the core sample, it's 150 years old for sure, but he said it could be anywhere from 163 to 180 years old based on its skirt. So it's an old tree. Yeah. Go ahead. These look like square frames or square inch frames. They're, they're all they're all shot full frame, but early on, because I was using Instagram as my medium to post the photos, I just embraced that square format. Plus, it it was different from what I've always done. My old photo editor at the Telegraph Herald, he he's published self published some books, so I invited him to come and meet me for coffee one day. This is the guy that fired me. <laughs> and we're still friends, so don't ever burn your bridges. So so Brian comes and meets, and we're having coffee. And uh, he, he couldn't wait to yuck it up about it because, you know, I was all the, the, the purest photo editor. Oh, my God. If they talked about cropping the photographer's work, you know, like, oh, it, was, it, was the, the, it was World War III because I'm going to fight him in the end. <laughs> and uh, he loved the fact that Hirsch is cropping his photos. <laughs> <in his stars. laughs> but honestly, it, it, was, it was a fresh view. I mean, it, it was, you know, another way for me to look at the world in a different way, to go out and pre-visualize a square composition versus a traditional horizontal or vertical, so, yeah, go ahead. In the blue check? Oh, no, I see you. Oh, yeah, okay, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> what, was it, what was it about the iPhone? That, was it the iPhone that inspired the project? Or was it done with any other camera with it? Yeah, well, well so, so I started doing it with the iPhone, and, and I was doing the photo a day with the iPhone, and it was way more challenging. I mean, you guys know what it's like. It's so easy to reach in your camera bag and pick out a different lens, um, and I've been doing that forever. And uh, Jim Sain asked me the same question when he interviewed me for the, the NBC thing. And, he, and I said to him, you know what, if I'd have shot it with my traditional cameras, it wouldn't be the same project. I don't think I would have worked as hard to challenge myself visually to make the images I made. I wouldn't have paid as close atten of attention to the quality of light as I did. Um, I'd be out there and I'd, I'd see situations that I thought would be a good picture, but the light wasn't right. So it's kind of like the days of feature hunting where you make a mental note, oh yeah, I need to go back there when I've got eastern light or I need a little overcast or whatever it might be. But yeah, I, I, I never never even considered shooting the project with anything but the iPhone after I started it. Yeah, go ahead. Did you miss the tree when you were done? Oh, I did, I did. <laughs> and uh, I, I still go down there. As a matter of fact, the day after the project officially concluded, um, <laughs> Warren said, Hurst, take a day off. Take a day off. But, but you know, uh, I took the dog with me. It's, it's near the end of the day, and I, I walk down there, and it's, the, the sun has already set, 
and it's, it's, it's deep blue, dusky sky, and I had my tripod with me, and, and I, I had to make a picture. And, and I posted it, and I, I, what did I say in it? Uh, good night, old friend, and all, all those 35 and 55 year old women that I'm trying to sell books to, every one of them sighed. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, Go ahead. Ah, uh, you know what? I, I, I have a strong appreciation for dairy farmers. They're hostage to their, their cattle. I, I forced myself to be hostage to a tree. And trust me, guys, it was a, a thoroughly rewarding, thoroughly enjoyable, thoroughly challenging project. But if I told my family I was going to commit for it for another year, oh my God. Oh my God, I, I would need to find a new apartment. <laughs> I, I'm still shooting photos though because honestly with a project like this, the book doesn't come out until August. I want people to continue to follow it. I want people to continue to buy books. I want people to potentially buy prints. So I'm still posting photos. I'm still shooting photos. Did yeah, you get, were there any circumstances where you'd already been to the tree that day and you said, I got to oh, go back? Something absolutely. Back. Absolutely. I was telling these guys last night about when I shot a picture in the morning, and I, I went to my office in Dubuque and did a bunch of stuff. And I got home and it's right around sunset, you know, it was in the fall. My wife has supper all cooked. She's just putting fresh salads on the table. And I'm at the sink washing my hands. And I turn around to sit down at a breakfast nook and that window looks to the west. And it was just like somebody flipped a switch. Oh my God, the light was unbelievable. So I'm like, I'll be right back. <laughs> but yeah, no, quality of light, changes in the weather. Uh, if I had the time, I definitely would go back. Go ahead. Um, Nick Lamb of the New York Times recently took a bunch of uh, photos at the Yankee Spring Training, and he used Instagram for it, and it yep. ended up on the front page of New York Times, and there's a lot of backlash from that from photojournalists um, saying that photography has died because of iPhones and Oh. oh, I I would say that's that's a, a foolish perspective. It's still a camera. It's still a tool. It, it still captures what you see. Um, I think the only fair complaint might be if they're whining about people using filters on the photos. But but the core content, it's still you know the iPhone isn't changing reality. Now guys, this wasn't a photojournalism project. This is a fine art project. I mean that's how I per perceive it and that's how I approached it. Um, there aren't any photos in here, but th there were some shots. There's one in particular where the light was gorgeous. It's sunrise, and you got this crazy highlight on the trunk of the tree, but I'm like, oh, God, I just need something different. And I, I held up an oak leaf, and I got this silhouette. I'm like, shit, there's my picture, and I made it. And I, I had no remorse whatsoever because it's a fine art picture. But if I'm out there shooting pictures with my iPhone and pa passing them off as photojournalism, it's still a camera, still capturing what I saw. Unless I'm totally altering it using filters, I think it's a silly complaint. What do you think, Scott? You agree? Oh, you I use your really iPhone pretty religiously. Yeah, I, I don't understand that attitude. Yeah, there's so many people. What's that? A lot of talkers are afraid that they're going to somehow lose money or your business because other people have cameras. Quite contrary. And, and go ahead, you had a question down here. Oh, I was just curious. Uh, do you ever get sick? <laughs> like, you know what? Honestly, this is one of those miraculous years where I was never sick and yeah, unable to take a picture. But I actually thought about that. And, and even when I was going to take the ski trip with my buddies, I'm like, oh my God, there's 4,000 people are following it. They expect their picture day. I really want to go on the ski trip. I wonder if I can get Joey Wallace and some of my other photographer friends. I honestly thought about it, guys. <laughs> Recruiting these guys. Hey, you guys want to be standing photographers? I'll give you credit, but I really want to take the ski vacation. Then I decided, you know what? Then I can't say I accomplished a, a photo a day for a year, so I, I sucked it up. Mm -hmm. um, Business-wise, what was I going to tell you? Yeah, I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. So I know uh, I had talked with Warren a little bit about this, and uh, when we got beer and pizza one day, he had like the blank pages of the book, and it looked like the quality just looked awesome. I mean, it looked yeah. like something that, you know, like when you, when you get a retrospective, I mean, it looked awesome. And I know you guys had done some kind of creative uh, licensing, or were uh, approaching some kind of like the Sierra Club. Oh yeah, well that's, yeah, exactly, that's what, sorry, I lost my train of thought yeah. when I took that question, and, and thank you. Yeah, so Warren and I have been trying to find ways to, to get it in front of people. Um, it's not photojournalism, I'm a photojournalist, but it's not photojournalism. And 
you know, photographers are all afraid to give away their content, okay? The, the most important content from this project is going to be the book. Um, it's, it's not a one-hit pony. I don't want to get the photo published and make a hundred bucks because somebody ran it as a, a, a you know, a six-inch image on a website or, or a, a quarter page in a newspaper or an eighth of a page in a magazine. That, you know, that's, that's zero money, zero-sum gain. But if we can sell books at 40 bucks a crack with a reasonable return on investment, that's where it's at for us. So Warren and I are both pretty con connected in the industry, so we've been reaching out to publications, um, trying to get them to do the story. And, and you know, first blush, they're all a little cautious. Then they go to the site and they look at the pictures and they're like, oh, wow, huh, these are actually pretty interesting photos. And then they discover a photo a day with an iPhone, piques their curiosity. And so most everybody that, that he's talked to that hasn't bought into it already, they're still considering buying into it. And so we've got some great PR. Wisconsin Public Radio did a broadcast interview with me. The, the NBC piece was the catalyst that got it all going. Um, and, and Warren has dealt with some photographers that are they're just like, they're like, are you kidding me? You're giving away your content? But do the math, do the math. The Des Moines Register did a story on me. And through analytics these days, you can see where every one of your customers comes from. So the Des Moines Register does a story on my project. They put a live link to the thattree.net website where we're selling books. What was it, Warren? Did we sell a couple hundred books or a hundred books? From which? From the Des Moines Register. The Des Moines Register sold 40 books at about 35 bucks a book. So okay. So it was $2,200 for the books versus maybe $200 of usage of the license. The yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I mean, it's, it's been incredible. And uh, the, the Denver Post sent me a bunch of questions. They're going to run a gallery. That'll run next week. And it's, it's just amazing how you can track where they came from and, and your, your return numbers. I mean, the rule of thumb is one-tenth of one percent for people that you present your project to as far as engagement, as far as action, actually buying a book. And for our Facebook audience, what is it? Ten percent? Yeah, imagine that. I mean, an, an advertiser's dream, a marketing expert's fantasy. And, but, but the thing is, it's these people are engaged. And there's no reason every one of you can't come up with a similar project. I mean, guys, it's a real simple concept. It's, it's in my backyard. Um, it, it wasn't easy. I won't say it was easy, but truly rewarding. And if the book continues to demonstrate the potential success it has, we sold almost 1,000 books before the book's even in print. That's insane. Go ahead. Pardon me? Did you have the upsample uh, the, the 12 by 12s are, you know, I can't tell you what percent they're upsampled, I think 30%. Just do a crop on one and you'll, and you'll see what it is. Um, the book, does that have to be 300 pixels an inch or 200? The book. 300 pixels. Yeah, so for the book, we're going to be upsampling them, you know, probably 40%. But I've done tests and I've printed them and it's incredible. Another technical question. Do you guys upsample in stairs? No, nope, no, nope. one fell swoop. Everything I've ever discovered, one fell swoop was better. I guess I, I'm not an expert on that, but I know, guys, I've been selling gallery prints, and I, I did a show, uh, an art show in Dubuque, with 20 prints, 12 by 12, 20 by 20 mats, and and it was unbelievable how nice they looked, and, and I sold all of it, 250 a crack. Now, as a result of the website. And I've got an art manager that's trying to market me to galleries and major galleries. They take most of them take 40% of whatever your your list price is for the work. So on the website now, the gallery prints assigned the number of gallery prints. I've got them on sale for $3.99 a print, and I've sold six of them already. Mm -hmm. So 400 bucks a print, and it's crazy. And so they look really good, and nobody's complained yet. They all get them and send me notes, going, "Holy crap, Paul, oh, we're so happy," and I'm so happy. Go ahead. <laughs> Has the tree project changed your approach to your commercial work? Oh, absolutely. Although, you know what, honestly, I'm trying to lay low. I've got so much stuff to do and Warren, Warren. You know, if any of you are going to do a book project, you need Warren or somebody like Warren to help you because we're all photojournalists. Unless you guys are different than me, I'm, I'm a great procrastinator. You know, do your contest entries the night before. <laughs> um, yeah, but, yeah, so. <laughs> Go ahead. Is this the 4S? The yeah, 4S. Yeah, everybody laughs. Oh, you're, the, oh, you're using the old phone. <laughs> yes, I am. So when you operate, what are you going to do with the one that you use? Oh, this is going nowhere. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm keeping that. You're going to sell it on the Find a really wealthy follower. <laughs>
Maybe like throw it into the up into the tree. And, <laughs> 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 and like, I just got to share another story about how engaged people are on this project. So a month out, I mean, literally, they're they're like, I'm getting these blue hoodoo notes from people, I and mean, they're really upset, and they're really frustrated, and they're really sad. Don't you want to keep doing it? Please, can't you just keep doing it? <laughs> and so, so I scheduled this event, the the final photo event. I created an event on Facebook, and all these people are posting me notes. And a friend of mine sent me a note. Oh God, Mark, I'm not going to be able to make it. I've got a conference in Milwaukee. Hey, can I send an ornament or a picture of me to hang on the tree? I'm like, oh my God, that's a great idea. So, so I created an update to the event, inviting people to send ornaments or pictures or something representative of them. We got 25 different items from people, including. Uh, a, a handmade card stitched together by hand with four oak leaves from a 200 year old oak tree in uh, Kildare, Ireland. Incredible. Hmm. You know, you look what we do as news photographers. I mean, I always thought I was making a difference in the, sh the picture I, I ran today, people forgot about it tomorrow. I, I never would have imagined that something as soft and fluffy as a photo day of an oak tree would engage people the way it has. And, and even the project in general, I mean, okay, there's photo editors and photographers in this room. If any of you as photographers came to me as a photo editor and said you want to shoot a photo day of an oak tree, eh, yeah, I don't think I'd be authorized to that. And as a photographer, as a photo editor, if I said that to you, how many of you would embrace that as a possible idea? You'd probably go to the editor and go, okay, Hirsch has lost his mind. <laughs> so. Any other questions, guys? Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.